Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. So I'm going to get down on my knees and pray and let's get anybody ready for the word of the Lord today? Women. This word today is so good. Trust me. Trust me. Your tongue's going to jump out of your head and slap your brain. I mean, it's that good. I've already heard it twice. I get to hear it two more times. You know, it takes me about four times to get it. Plus all the study and meditation, talking to God. Then I finally get it. The rest of you get it just like that. So it's kind of cool. So I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God. You need God. Thank you, chaplain. Appreciate you. And let's go before the Lord. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. We thank you for a mighty move of your spirit. Because, Lord, the Holy Spirit is the teacher. Not a man, not a woman, not a tall man, not a short man, not a white man, not a black man, not a brown man. Listen, not a young man, not an old man. We haven't come to hear from men or women. We've come to hear from the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts and our lives. This day, we're just grateful, grateful people. Lord, as you bless us, we would ask that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our Baptist brothers, Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Four Square Denomination, Trinity, Emmanuel, Ecclesia, The Way. We thank you, God, for San Bernardino Temple. We thank you for our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters. At no time, Lord, do we think of ourselves as better than any of them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's, but yours. May all the praise and glory go to you. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. amen. Well, as you take your seat, go with me to Hebrews in the fourth chapter. May I say this to you as a reminder? I said in the beginning, when we started to go to Hebrews in the fourth chapter, I said, boy, the fourth chapter is a power-packed chapter. It's just so full of information. We've been here for months. We're about the last verse, but we're still going to take our time on that. And I want you to know something. Look forward to the next chapter. That's chapter number five. Chapter number five is just as brilliant, just as power-packed, maybe not quite as long as number four, but it is amazing. And we're going to have a great time in chapter number five. But before we do, today I'm taking you to a verse that's probably one of the most powerful verses in scripture. A verse that a lot of people can quote, but very, pe- very few people understand how to live it. Without an understanding of this verse, you will never attain to what you need to be, never do what you need to do, never say what you need to say, never go where you never need to go. You're never going to be what God's called you to be without really an understanding of the depth of this verse. This is an amazing, absolutely incredible, and even bizarre verse that we have a hard time understanding, hard time relating to. Um, Before I read the verse to you, I'm going to give you the title because it's really kind of a cool title. Acquiring a Spiritual Backbone. Without a backbone, without a spiritual gumption, without, if you will, a tenacity, without, if you will, a, a boldness to face the future, you will never be what God wants you to be or do what God would have you to do. Everything that you'll ever do that'll bless your life, you're going to have to fight for. And a lot of times we don't realize that. We think Christianity is just a time of love and a time of peace and a time of doing nothing. You know, where Jesus comes along and says, if someone hits you on the right cheek, turn your, uh, on the right side, turn your n- cheek to him, the next side of your cheek. And we have an idea that we don't have to do anything, yet we find the Bible is all through war, all through trials, tribulations, pressure, people pushing through problems to make things happen. And that's the war that you and I are in. The destiny that God has for you, the purpose of why you're on this planet, 
The things that you want to attain and accumulate and conquer and go forth, you're going to have to fight for. And if you don't know how to fight for it, it isn't going to work. The Old Testament is full of warring. God is even described as a God of war. The New Testament is not any different. You'll find that great men of God said you're going to have to fight a good fight of faith. Gives you the weapons of your warfare in the New Testament. Tells you that you shall live by faith. This is a war that you and I are in. And there's a whole enemy out there trying to stop you from the destiny that Jesus Christ paid for on that cross at Calvary. But if you understand the principle just of this one verse, it'll change your life. It'll change your future. It'll change what you do and how you do it. Just this one little verse is an amazing verse. Let me read it to you, if I may, found in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verse number 16. It says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in a time of need. Do you see the words let us right there? The words let us means it's your option. You can do it or not do it. I find that most people don't understand it, so they don't do it. That sometimes God gives us a way of doing things and tells us how to do things. But we don't always do it that way. It's like somebody giving you a million or a billion dollars and you don't have any idea where it's at. You don't know how to spend it. And you never do spend it. What good is it then? Not any good at all. God comes along and gives us a verse that's power packed and he says, here's what I want you to understand. This is how you're going to attain things. This is how you're going to bring yourself into the position that Jesus paid for on that cross. But I understand this. So let us, therefore, it's something that he's saying to you. It's your option. You can do it or not do it. If you do it, you're going to get blessed. If you don't do it, you're going to fail. And then he comes, and then see the word therefore. The word therefore, you ought to circle it in your Bible. The word therefore is an interesting word. It's there for all the verses that he said before that. That you have a high priest, his name is Jesus Christ, not like any earthly high priest there's ever been. This high priest, Jesus Christ, that we're talking about was not ordained by man, but was ordained by God himself. Was not just born of man, but he was also born of the Father himself. You will find that he is God, creator of the heavens and the earth, and he's your high priest. He didn't just have, if you will, an atonement in his mind for one year. He had an atonement in his mind and his heart for eternity. He didn't just pay the price for you and I with the blood of bulls and goats. No, our high priest, therefore, that's why the words are there, is different. He paid the price of your freedom with his own personal blood. This is an amazing expression. Now he comes along and he makes this statement. Let us now, therefore, come boldly. That means with some spiritual background to the throne of grace. Notice how he says the throne of grace. He doesn't say the throne of God. He says the throne of grace. There's a reason why he calls it the throne of grace. Grace, God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. Once again, let me explain it to you again. Grace, God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. You put in the natural, he puts in the super, you've got supernatural. But you're going to have to put the natural in, he puts the super in, now you've got the supernatural. Grace is not just unmerited favor where he comes along and you didn't earn it, it's more than that. It's the very ability of God to get the job done when you've gone as far as you can, God will take you further. And he comes along and he makes this statement, therefore come boldly, not just with a, a little whining, bawling, squalling attitude, but come boldly to the throne of grace where you can, listen to this, that we may obtain mercy and find grace. That Listen to this, listen to this, grace to help in a time of need. One translation says in the nick of time. I don't know about you, but my God, it always seems to be in the nick of time. When I'm about to fail, when I'm about to give up, even sometimes after I've failed and after I've given up, then he comes through. It's almost like he puts me to the pressure to see how far I'm going to go before he finally answers the questions. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Have you ever, here let me say it like this, have you ever broken down to that's it, I give up, I quit, then the answer comes? And it's almost like you got to get out of the way in order for his grace to get in and take it as far as what needs to go. And in the nick of time, we must approach the throne of grace. That's what he's talking about. If I can give you an illustration of boldness, if I can give you a definition of boldness today, this is a fun one. Listen closely. Confidence with courage equals boldness. 
Confidence with courage. I can have courage but have no confidence. I can have confidence and have no courage. But confidence with courage brings me to a place of boldness. I can have confidence and courage in my ability and it'll only take me so far. But when I have confidence and courage in his ability, I go a whole lot further. Is anybody listening? This is not about my ability. It's not about your ability. It's not about your talent. Not about my talent. It isn't about your gifting. It isn't about my gifting. It isn't about how cool we are, or smart we are, or gifted we are, or how much we have intelligence. It's not about that at all. It's all about whether or not we have a relationship with Jesus. In the relationship with Jesus comes the boldness, the real confidence with courage that takes me to a place of the expression of boldness before the throne of grace that gets me the ability of God to operate on my behalf where I can't do it. He comes in and causes those things to happen that I can't get done. Is anybody listening to me? And so it's an amazing an understanding. May I say this to you? I said it before. I want to emphasize it now. This is all about a relationship in Jesus. My boldness doesn't come, again, by how smart I am or how smart and cool and quick and cute you are. It doesn't come with whether or not you're born into a social system or have economic backgrounds. doesn't come whether or not you're educated. It doesn't come whether or not you're tall, short, white, black. doesn't matter. It comes, listen to this, my boldness and your boldness has got to come because of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that relationship you've got to understand is a relationship in Christ Jesus. As I approach the throne of grace, that's where the high courts of heaven is. That's where the Father God grants that which I need to take place for me. I have got an advocate. His name is Jesus. My attorney goes before that. He now feels who I am according to the verses that we read earlier. He now knows me. Me. He now understands me and he goes before the high courts of heaven. He makes the petitions for me. Therefore, in him, I approach the throne of grace. I don't go to God and say, well, God, I need help. God, I've just broken down. I'm a nobody. I'm a loser. I'm a failure. God already knows that about you. He already knows that about me. May I say that? There is no doubt about it. But I want you to know something. I'm not approaching the throne of grace in who I am. I'm approaching the throne of grace in who he is and his name name is Jesus, the only begotten Son of God. And as I approach in Him, now I come up not with the boldness of who I am, which doesn't take me very far at all, but I come now with the boldness of who He is. I am in Christ Jesus. Therefore, I can boldly approach the throne of grace and make my petitions known and expect God the Father to hear me. Without that, my friends, Without an understanding of that, you will approach the throne of grace and who you are. Whining, bawling, squalling, saying to God how you're a loser, how you've never had the cards dealt properly to you. You've always been on the short end of the stick. You've never had a break. Your dad was a creep. Your mom was a goof. Your relatives hate your guts. Your school teacher tear, tore you apart. The sergeant in the army slapped you around. You never had a break and your big brother spit on you. But let me tell you something. God already knows all of that. That's not about this. You do not approach the throne of grace in who you are. You approach the throne of grace in who he is. Therefore, I don't come in my own power. I don't come in how cool I am. I come in how great he is, the son of God. Because I'm in him. Check it out for yourself. You're right there in Hebrews anyway. Go with me, if you will, into Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse number 19. Is anybody listening this morning? Turn me in your Bible to Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse number 19. It says, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and my boldness has got to come, my spiritual backbone to win the battle, to draw from God the things that I need. That spiritual awakening on the inside of me has got to come because of a relationship that I have with Jesus Christ. Listen to what it says, having boldness to enter into the holiest, that's where God the Father is, listen to this, by the blood of Jesus Christ. That is an amazing expression. Not by my who I am, not by who you are, but by who he is. 
Listen to what the word of God has to say. Uh, turn me to Ephesians, the third chapter, verse number 12. In Ephesians, the third chapter, speaking of Jesus, in whom, the Bible says, we have boldness and access, listen to this, with confidence through faith, how? Oh, in him. I make my petitions not based on who I am and how great I am, what I can do, how many verses I know, whether I went to church or didn't go to church. I make my boldness, confidence to God because of who Christ Jesus is and I'm where? In him. Notice it. In whom? In him. In whom? In him. In whom? In him. And if you approach the throne of grace some other way, you're not going to get anything open to you. This is not about just winning the heart of God. You already got the heart of God or you wouldn't have sent his son Jesus. But God, I'm in need. That's why he sent his son Jesus. He knows you're in need. The answer to the need is the weather fact if you're born of the spirit of God, you are now in Christ. Jesus gives you access to the holy of holies through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and that gives you the boldness to boldly approach the throne of grace and obtain mercy. Wow. I like what it says in 1 John, the fourth chapter. Go there with me in your Bible. Circle this, kind of cool. 1 John, little John, fourth chapter, verse number 17 says it like this. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. You know why you and I have boldness in the day of judgment? Not because you're a tither, not because you went to church. All of that you need to do. Don't misunderstand me. You have boldness in the day, not because you lived and was a nice guy and the police didn't chase you around, you fit into the social system. You have boldness in the day of judgment. Let me tell you how, because you're in Christ Jesus. Because as he is, so are we in this world. What is he? Man, he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the only begotten son of God himself. His blood washed us clean. He's the one that walked on water, created the heavens and the earth. He's the one that holds the moon in its right distance and takes care of the sun so it doesn't burn us up. So it, it, he's the one who puts it all together. He speaks and stars come out. He's God. And because of him, and as he is, so are we. We are washed by the blood. Why are we like him? Because we're in him. Does that make us perfect? We are spiritually, not physically. We're still working that part out. We still mess up, screw up, but thank God for the blood. It washes that away even that. As long as we keep on going with God, somebody ought to give me a great big amen. amen. My point there is so important for us. It all comes, this boldness, this spiritual backbone I'm talking about that you need, that I need to make our businesses work, to make life work, to make our marriages work, to make our children work, to make everything that we believe, to witness to our relatives in order for us to be that person who changes the world that we live in. My goodness sakes, it all comes through a relationship with Jesus. And because of that relationship of Jesus, of being in him, I can now boldly approach the throne of grace. In other words, with a spiritual background, spiritual backbone, because I know where I am in him. That's a good point. Yes, it is. Let me tell you what godly boldness does. Spiritual backbone do three things this morning. I want to share them with you. Three things that spiritual backbone will do are godly boldness. Number one, helps us to do right. We live in a world of wrong. Have you noticed that? Wrong is right, right's wrong. The thinking is totally messed up. I've never seen thinking like this. I'm 67 years old. My next birthday, I'll be 68 years old. I've never seen the thinking that goes on today that people accept. I never thought in a million years anybody would ever even talk about such stuff publicly. Now they accept it as the norm. It's like right is wrong, wrong is right. In order for me to do right, I don't do right according to the social system. I don't even do right according to the moral majority. I don't give a flip what they say. I want to do right according to the word of God. And in order for me to live according to the word of God, there's some things that are going to come against me and to try to stop me from being all that God would have me to be or to cause me to compromise my position of wanting to do right. In other words, right becomes what the world says instead of right becoming what God says. And when you let the world dictate what's right, you're a mess. And in order to do right, sometimes it's going to cost you something. And unless you're bold... You'll never do what's right. 
and what's right is what God says. I want to take you to the scripture. I want to show it to you for, for yourself. May I take you there? And Mark, go there with me, if you will, in Mark, the 15th chapter. I want to talk to you about a man by the name of Joseph Aramea. Now, a lot of people don't know who Joseph Aramea is. He isn't one of the most popular persons speak or spoke of in the New Testament, but he's an interesting character. Joseph Aramea was somebody who was very prominent, very wealthy, had a lot of authority, had a lot of recognition, approval, and acceptance of men. He was one who was a leader in his community. He spoke and people followed. He, people admired who Joseph was. He was a wealthy man who had a wealthy business. And he was prosperous in every area and became a leader in his community. And he put it all on the line for doing what was right. You see, he was going to go to Pontius Pilate and he felt moved by God to do something. To redeem the body of Jesus and get it ready for a burial. You don't do that after he's been crucified as a heretic. You don't go there and expose yourself as a follower of Jesus and expect your business to continue, expect your authority to continue, expect men to praise you and give you recognition and approval. You're going to have to give up all of the attention you give. Your identity is going to be shot forever. In fact, the proof of that is Peter himself. Right before the crucifixion, how many times do you remember he denies Jesus? He doesn't want to associate with Jesus. Now, here comes this prominent man who wants to associate and does it because of something. It becomes a person now that he is standing before the people and he is now associated with Jesus Christ, which means he's going to have tremendous loss in his business, tremendous loss in his authority, tremendous loss in his identity, tremendous. But listen, it's not about identity. It's not about who you are. It's not about whether people approve of you or don't approve of you. It's about whether or not you're doing what is right with God. The 15th chapter of Mark says these words, and it's really cool, verse number 43. Joseph Aramea, a prominent council member. I just want, I should have underlined the words prominent council member. It's saying that for a reason. It's trying to describe to you and I how important the man was. A prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God coming and taking courage, coming and taking courage, coming and taking courage, went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Boldness, his courage, his confidence makes him and causes him to do what's right. In a world that'll try to get you to compromise, calling it right when it's really wrong because it's contrary to the ways of God, in a world that will try to defeat you by being sly and getting you off track, when you know to do something right, you end up doing it wrong just to please other people. I'm here to tell you something, a confident boldness that you need to have, this spiritual backbone that he's talking about because of your association with Jesus Christ is something that will take you to the throne of God and bless your life. Second thing, let's talk about it this morning. We're talking about godly boldness and spiritual backbone, what it'll do. Number one, it'll help you to do right. But I like number two. It'll develop a spiritual platform. It'll develop a spiritual platform. May I say this to you? You will never speak into the lives of anybody. Let me say it again so you hear me. You will never speak into the lives of anybody. I'm going to say it one more time so you get the picture. You will never speak into the lives of anybody until you have a spiritual platform where they allow you to speak into life because they want to hear what you have to say. I remember when I first became a Christian, everybody in my family, relatives, would go, oh yeah, okay, cool, that's nice, that's good for you, don't bother me with it. Today, after all of these years, when they have a problem, guess who they call? I didn't say they ever do what I say, but they still call me. They're still pretty stupid. 
What we fail to remember is this. We need a spiritual platform to speak into the lives of our children. We need a spiritual platform to speak into the lives of our husband and our wife. We need a spiritual platform to speak in the lives of people around you, your boss, the people at the coffee shop, the people at the coffee bar. Without that, you're just an unimportant person they're not going to listen to. And you'll talk a lot, but it'll never get anywhere. But with a spiritual platform, the doors are open and things happen. And it comes through being bold. This entire church was built because of the boldness that we found in Christ Jesus to believe God for something beyond that which is norm. The seats you're sitting in, the clean, immaculate children's church, the 3,500 children that come to church here every single week, the thousands of youth that come every single week, the, 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 the 24,000 adults that come to church here uh, month after month after month. The reason for that is because someone had spiritual boldness to stand up and say, in Christ Jesus, all things are possible to him that believes. Come on, somebody. And you can boldly approach the throne of grace, getting and obtaining the things that you need to have. And may I say this to you, without a spiritual platform, nothing gets done. We just got back from two weeks of speaking to a denomination, and the pastors of a denomination. We were the keynote, only keynote speakers for that denomination in Australia. That denomination is all over the world, in Europe, even in the United States. Uh, we had people from Europe and the United States there, pastors from Australia, and they wanted to find out what in the heck is going on at this church. If we just did nothing and said nothing, never showed up on Sunday, never fought a good fight of faith, never were bold with the devil, never took the authority and told the devil to go to hell. We're not listening to that and listening to the junk that you are putting on us. We're going on in the things of God and believing God for great and mighty marvelous things. Can I tell you something? You will never be successful until you do. That's why we had a spiritual platform. They're not going to invite me down there to speak to them, open their hearts, their lives, and consider changing the, uh, the, the strategy strategies of their churches because I'm a nice person, which I am, <laughs> they're going to do it because of a spiritual platform. God's given us a spiritual platform. The spiritual flat platform came because of boldness. Let me show you that if I may. Let me take you to the scripture, Acts. Go there with me real quick in Acts, the fourth chapter, verse number 13. Acts, the fourth chapter. Here we see an illustration of this with Peter and John. Acts, the fourth chapter, verse 13 says this. Now, when they saw the boldness, everybody say boldness. boldness. Nah. <laughs> Come on, play with me. You need to wake up a little bit. Everybody say boldness. boldness. Much better. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived they were uneducated and untrained men. They saw who they were. These guys didn't fit in. They're uneducated. They're people that didn't work. They, they're people that didn't get it. They're people that didn't fit and flow with society. They're not the people that we would go to dinner with. They're not the people we would hang out with. But something happened because of the boldness that they saw in them. They were doing something. Listen to what it says. It says they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. I'm telling you something, when you have boldness, people will know you're not just talking out of your hat. You've got something to say from God. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. And you and I need to have every day of our life a spiritual platform to the friends that you have, to the neighbors that you know, to the people that you work with, the people at the coffee counter, the people in the restaurant, the people in the grocery store, the people in the every area, a spiritual platform. When you have it, you can speak and they listen. And it comes because you're bold enough to stand up for the things of God. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. Third and last one for today, we're talking about a backbone. We're talking about spiritual boldness and acquiring a, a spiritual backbone. Listen to this, is it helps you to speak the word of God. The bottom line, without boldness, you won't speak the word of God. The devil will talk you out of it. 
What that stupid, he'll tell you. That, what do you have to say about that? Who cares whether you speak it out loud or not? But I want you to know something. There's something happens, I don't know what it is, that when you speak the word of God out loud, listen to the old man, listen to grandpa, when you speak the word of God out loud, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When you speak it out loud, it changes the world. A creative power of God. God goes out and starts to change things. I've got to speak the word of God over myself all the time. I'm healed by the stripes. You know, the older you get, the weirder you get. All kinds of things want to grow on your body that never grew there before. It's like creepy, you know what I'm talking about? This is kind of like creepy, you know? You ever see people that are older, they got all kinds of growths all over them? It's like, my goodness, I'm starting to get them. Instead of tolerating them, I started speaking the word of God over them. I said, in the name of Jesus, you creepy thing, get off my body. In the name of Jesus, get off of me and you get out of here now. I break that off you, you foul, ugly thing. In the name of Jesus, you know, just go to hell. You're not going to uh, hang around me any longer. I'm preaching the gospel in Australia. And I wiped my forehead. I had a little growth on my forehead. I figured it's just old age. I'm wiping my forehead. And as I'm preaching, I wipe my forehead. That growth just popped off in my hand. How gross is that? <laughs> totally like the growth. I'm going, oh, and I didn't miss a beat, man. My, I just going on. I got this growth in my hand. I'm going, Oh, thank God, I'm thinking to myself, the word of God works, you foul thing just get, and I'm going like this. <laughs> Years ago, I started getting arthritis. My knuckles are all swollen up, my back's all tight. I decided to stop putting up with that. My father was a boxer. He used to tell me my hands are all broken up from boxing. It wasn't. They were all full of arthritis. He called it boxing. <laughs> Wasn't that way at all. I started speaking the word of God over myself. Let me tell you something, arthritis. You're not of God. You get out of my body in the name of Jesus and take pain with you in the name of... Why? Be listen to this. I'm healed by the stripes of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I've got the mind of Christ, therefore I don't have any fear. God's, I live by the, uh, not the vanity of man, but the, but the wisdom of God. The word of God says I'm healed. Let me tell you something. Here's something I have not been able to do in years. And I'm not taking one pill. I don't take any of that Celebrex. I don't take any of that Aleve. I don't take any. My Aleve is the word of God and it works. And I haven't been able to make a fist like that in years. Now opening it's another problem. No, I'm not, I'm not really kidding you. I want you to hear me now, what I'm saying. You got to speak the word of God over you. Hey, listen to this about your prosperity. It just doesn't happen. God says these words about you. Why does he say it? So you can speak it over yourself. You've got to be bold about that unless you want to be broke all the rest of your life. My Bible says God gives you the power to get, in the, in the, uh, to get uh, wealth. My Bible says that God makes all grace abound toward you, that you should always have all things and have an abundance for every good work. My Bible says God meets all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I just happen to have a need to be prosperous economically, God because I choose to feed the poor. I choose to find and pay off churches. I choose to be a prosperous man. And I found this out too. The word of God says that God gets pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. Therefore, God, I'm going to bring great pleasure to you because I'm going to prosper. I will not live in the vanity of man, but I will live in the prosperity of my God. And I speak the word of God creating it. How about this? Everything I put my hand to, these hands, I shall what? Prosper. You got to speak the word of God. If you don't have boldness, what you'll do is just let it happen to you. You'll just say, I just hold. I just don't know how I'm going to do this. Oh, I hope I'm not like my mother. I hope I'm not like my father. I want you to know something. God's given you the mind of Christ. 
listen to this, a mind of Christ, sharp, tough. Man, I, I'm, I'm pushing 68 years old. I'm starting another business. Glory to God, I'm just, I'm just starting in life. I'm gonna find, you hear me? You mark my words. I'm gonna finance the gospel around the world. Here's the way I think about it. If God can give the grace to a Bill Gates and a Warren Buffett, how much more can he do with a man of God? And the devil just go to hell over it. It's the way it is. You got to start speaking this. Let me prove it to you. That's just kind of exciting, but let me prove it. Acts 4, chapter, verse number 31. I'll just pop it up on the overhead. And when they had prayed, the whole place of the assemblies together was shaken. And when they were filled with the Holy Ghost, they spoke the word of God. They spoke the word of God. What's the last two words? Yell it out at me. He could have just stopped. They spoke the word of God. He didn't just speak the word of God. They spoke it with boldness. Are you following me? Listen to this in Acts 19, chapter, verse number 8. It says this, And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading uh, concerning the things of the kingdom of God. Three months he's in there speaking what? Boldly. In order to speak the word of God, you've got to be bold. You've got to have a spiritual backbone. In other words, you'll lay down to the circumstances that your life will put on you. This is not about the circumstances that life in old age or young age or educated age or uneducated age or money or not money. It's not about money. It's about your heart. And if you can come boldly before the throne of grace and make your petitions known to God, let me tell you something. You can obtain the mercy that you need and find in a time of need that God will meet all of your needs. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. Three things today. Helps you to, to do right. Boldness will help you to develop that platform. Number three, it helps you to speak God's word. And speaking God's word creates an atmosphere of God's power around your future. You need to speak it out loud. That's what this is all about. You do not need to settle for what this world or what this life will hand you. You can only settle for what God has for you. And it's different than what everybody else is going to get because you're a child of God. Now here's the deal. I'm finished. And you can think I'm as crazy as you want to think. But just check it out and watch and see whether God doesn't back me because I'm in Christ Jesus. Somebody ought to give the Lord a great big praise. Watch and see. Watch and see. I want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you go. Everybody remain seated. Everybody remain seated. Let the ushers finish their job. Hey, 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 hey. I got your attention. Sit down. Sit down. I want to make sure everybody's all right with God. Nobody leave. Let's talk just for a moment. Give me your attention. Worst thing that could happen to you. Worst thing. Here's the worst thing. You walk out of this building, your heart stops. Bang. You die and you go to hell. That is like horrible. I want to make sure that's not going to happen to you. You do not want that to happen to you. I want to make sure. So I want to ask you this question. I want you to answer it in your heart. Nobody will know but you and God. Here's the question. If you were to walk out of this building, your heart stopped, you died. Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Answer the question in your heart. Now, don't just stare at me. Answer the question in your heart. And then let's talk about your answer because your answer says a lot about really where you're at with God. Some of you said, well, Pastor Jim, I think I'm going to go to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say you can think your way into heaven? You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you. Some of you said, well, I love God a lot, Pastor Jim. I'm going to go to heaven because I love God. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you love God. I'm glad you love God, but you're not going to make it because you say you love God. 
Some of you said, well, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, I, I'm really a good person. I'm going to go to heaven because I'm good. You know most Americans think they're going to heaven because they're good? Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible, doesn't say it in the Bible, that'll get you to heaven because you're good. You're not going to make it. Somebody, now listen to this, listen to this, listen, listen. Somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you that you're not going to make it. And I love you, respect you, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. So you better listen. Listen closely so you don't miss the train to heaven because you're going to miss it if you don't. Listen closely. Some of you might say to yourself, well, Pastor Jim, you don't understand. My mom and dad told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. I've always thought of myself as a Christian. Why well, they christened me or baptized me when I was a baby, put a cross St. Christopher around my neck, took me to catechism class, Sunday school or Sabbath school class when I was a child. Great, I'm glad they did. It proves you had great parents. But can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible, nowhere, does it say you get to go to heaven because your mom and dad did that for you. It's not in the Bible and you're not going to make it. Some of you might say to yourself, well, Pastor Jim, wait a minute, hold on, I'm going to go to heaven. I joined my last church, I was there for 20 years, sang in a choir, helped the pastor, taught Sunday school. Hey, I'm glad you did, but guess what? Nowhere in the Bible it said because you joined the church, sing in the choir, helped the pastor, teach Sunday school, you get to go to heaven. Nowhere. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you the truth. Today, God has a divine appointment for you. You've had a lot of appointments in your life, some with plumbers and pa painters and doctors and attorneys. But today, God brought you here for a reason, so that you would get right with God. Don't miss this appointment. You've missed a lot of appointments, a lot of things in your life. Today, you have an appointment, a divine one, with God. Today, this is your day of salvation. And I want you to hear what I'm going to say to you. Because Jesus makes a statement. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. In other words, you can't get to heaven your way. You can't even get to heaven my way. We can't get to heaven some well-meaning church committee's way. If we're going to get to heaven, we're going to have to get to heaven his way. That's what this is all about. And he tells us exactly in the scripture what's his way. Don't you think the one who knew you were in trouble and knew you needed God, who was a beaten, bloody mess, nailed to the cross, raised from the dead on the third day, seated at the right hand of the Father so you could go to heaven, do you think he'd just leave it up to you to think about how you're going to get there? Or do you think he would tell you exactly how to get there? And he does in John 3rd chapter. He says these words, you must be born again. Bottom line, you must be born again. You must be born. Jesus said it, I didn't, again. Did you know that most people who attend American churches don't know what born again means? All they know about born again is they don't like born again people. And the reason they don't like born again people is because they've been portrayed by movies and television shows and magazines and books and articles as fanatics and weirdos and goofballs. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. When he said you must be born again, let me explain what it means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible means you've given God all of your heart. means you've given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Bottom line, all or nothing. And I'll prove it to you, last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus himself is speaking. He says, I'm coming again. When I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, listen to me now, listen, listen, listen. If I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Wow, what a crude, rude statement. Do you know what he really just said? Here's what he really just said. People who call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. Yep, people that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. And they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Let me define for you what's lukewarm. Lukewarm, a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down. Lukewarm, token prayer, occasional church attendance. Lukewarm, here's lukewarm. Listen, you're not against God. Oh no, you're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Here's lukewarm. God is something in your life, but he's not everything in your life. Truth is, if you don't make him everything, he'll never be something. Today is your day to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. You're in this safe, friendly place. We've laughed, we've clapped, we've sung we heard the Word of God. You are great listening to the Word of God, by the way. But it won't do you any good until you start off with the right relationship with God. And you've got to have to give Him. Notice how I emphasize the word give Him. You know why? He won't steal it from you. He's not a thief. It's your heart. 
in your life. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it or a manipulator to make you do it. In fact, he could have made a million trillion robots that look just like you, but he didn't. He made you just the way you are, gave you a choice. Will you choose him or not choose him? Will you give him all of your heart or not give him all of your heart? It's your call. And today, God is telling you the truth. Today, God's calling you home. Today, you have a divine appointment with God. Today is your day of salvation. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I get right with God then? Well, let's do it God's way. Let's don't do it man's way, my way or anybody else. God's way is this. If you confess me before men, Jesus says, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up, and then you put it right back down. It's as simple as that. What did you just do? You made a statement. I want Jesus. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. I'm a man. I'll see it. He says, if you confess me, before men, I'm a man, I'll see it. I'll confess you as mine before the Father. But if you deny me, sit there like this when you know you need to get your hand up. When the time comes, he will deny you. Listen to me, God doesn't lie. He'll have to, even though he doesn't want to because he loves you. He'll have to do what is right. He'll deny you. Today, let's make it easy for him as well as yourself. Those of you that know you need to give God all of your heart, you haven't given him all of your heart, get ready to put your hand up. If you haven't given them all of your life, get ready to put your hand up. You know who you are. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're just not sure, make sure. Back in the family rooms, I'm talking to you. If you've never given them all of your heart, never given them all of your life, I'm talking to you. Back in the foyer, I'm talking to you. Down at the Love Rock Cafe, out at the plaza, wherever you're seated at the church, listening to me, my, you hear my voice right now. Get ready to put your hand up. Today is your day. God will see you, but all across this auditorium, Again, today is your day. You say, Pastor, if I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be. But it's better to be embarrassed in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever because you care more about what people see instead of what God sees. Today is your day of salvation. Don't let anything stop you. Listen to me. You won't even get saved until you're bold with this commitment. Are you following me? There's no little mental ascension towards God that gets you to heaven. It's going to have to make a bold commitment publicly. And today is your day. With every head up and every eye open, don't believe in that bowing your head and closing your eyes stuff. If you can't even face it here in a safe place, you'll never face it in the world. Today is your day. I'm counting to three. I've done my job. Get ready. Pop your hand up. Put it right back down. I won't embarrass you, but don't be a fool and not do this. Today is your day. Ready? Here it is. One. Two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Thank you. Nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Thank you. Back over here. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Thank you. 21. Thank you. I thought I saw another one. There's 22 back there on this side. 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. Thank you. Back here. 35, 36. Thank you. God bless you. Where are you? Back over here is another bunch of them back over there. 36, 37. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Real quick, 37. There's another 38 right here going for God. Anybody else? Where are you? 40. There's 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46 back over here. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? There's another one. 42, uh, what, 46, 47, 48. In the family room, 49, 50, 51, 52. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you. Down here somewhere, there's another. Oh, there you are, 50, 53. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. In God good, there's another one. 54. God bless you. 55. Thank you. God bless you. 56. God bless you. Is anybody saved in here today? <laughs> Listen to me. All of you in here, I want to thank you for letting me do that every service or one of our pastors. It's because you let me do that, that 56 people that would have gone to hell if they should die are now going to go to heaven. So here's what I want you to do. I think you ought to give the Lord a great big praise for 56 people. Thank you for letting me do that. Thank you for letting me do that. Now here's what I want you to do. All 56 of you, I want you to stop messing with God. You're not going to want to do this, but you need to do it. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, 
If Jesus could be a beaten, bloody mess for you, walk in the streets of Golgotha for you, you can walk the streets of this aisle and come up here in front. All, I don't want anybody to leave, but I want all 56 of you, or whoever didn't raise your hand, you can come to. Get your stuff, get out of your seat, and get down here right now. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, and hear the Spirit call. Oh, come on, come on home. Come on home. Oh, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. Come and see. Come and receive. Come on home. Come on home. They're coming. Come on, let them up. Let them come. He'll give you strength. Oh, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. You come too. Come on. Come on. Just taste the living water. They're still coming. They're still coming. They're still coming. They're still coming. Coming, they're still coming. Oh, and straight for today. Thank Just God, thank God, thank God, thank God you've come. All of you put a smile on your face. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. You're not going to die and go to hell. You're going to heaven. That's party time. Are you hearing me? This is good. This is good. This is good. Over here, real quick, I want you to look to your left. See this guy waving at you. His name is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's going to do three things. Let me tell you what they are so you won't be afraid. Number one, he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You need to invite him in. He doesn't come in because you need him. He went to the cross because you need him. He comes in because you invite him. He's a gentleman. Number two, he's going to give you some free information about what to do next. Read the booklet, simple as it can be, third grade reading level. Read the booklet, do what it says about what to do next. Simple as that, it's free. We love the free word around here. Second, thirdly, he's going to teach you and share with you about our spiritual personal trainer program. You need help to go on with God. Listen, don't give me the baloney, you go to some other church. Don't give me that. I'm not putting up with it. I'm going to be bold with you right now. You don't go to that other church, and it never got you saved anyway. This is your new church, and that's the way it ought to be. And so this place you got right with God. This place God called you home. This place God touched you. Give us some time to help you get strong with Jesus. Don't go back doing the same old stuff that was a loser before. Let's go on with Jesus and let us help you. Pastor Dave will explain all that to you. It's wonderful. Only takes a few moments. People you came with, they'll wait for you, okay? So make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over that way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.